Uh, Rebecca is a research fellow at the University of Auckland and was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in phase one of the challenge. She is a conceptual ecologist across several challenge funded projects with the aim of introducing ecological theory into management frameworks. Uh, Rebecca, um, welcome to Wellington um, and welcome uh, to the conference. No mai haere mai. Kia ora tato, ko Rebecca Gladstone Gallagher toku ingoa, hey marine ecologist aho e waipapa taumatoro. So Jasmine's just introduced us to the idea that stresses can sometimes leave deep footprints that can be very slow or difficult to recover. My talk is about some frameworks that we've been developing um, using ecological knowledge of disturbance recovery dynamics in marine systems to guide specifically how recovery trajectories may differ in different places and times. We've developed these frameworks to illustrate how this um, ecological information on disturbance recovery can be tremendously useful to guide environmental managers who are trying to manage for um, ecosystem improvement rather than just simply halting decline. So the widespread degradation and loss of coastal ecosystem function and services means that we're now kind of moving towards a situation where we need to manage for improvement um, rather than just halting decline. And whether we decide to manage for improvement or not can have um, many social dimensions to it, which are about um, what are we managing towards, what does recovery look like to us, and what are our aspirations for a place. But once we decide to manage for improvement, there's some biophysical science questions that can help determine the likelihood of success, whatever that's determined to look like. Um, and this can include things like timeframes for recovery, what types of interventions might be appropriate in different situations. Um, and, and these biophysical aspects that I'm going to talk about today can be um, can give managers a lot of useful information that can aid their decisions of when and where to act and, and how long things might take to, to show their changes. But a key characteristic of ecosystem responses are that they're highly context dependent and this means that what happens in one place and time won't necessarily happen in another place or time. And this is a real challenge um, to deal with, which is m part of the motivation for these kinds of frameworks. So when managing for recovery, there are different recovery trajectories that can complicate our predictions of, um, of success. Um, recovery is often a non-linear process, and this can create difficulties in determining the time frames for recovery or if it will even occur, if it's even possible. Um, each of these recovery trajectories has some biophysical conditions that increase the likelihood of it occurring. So for example, um, bottlenecks can occur if if a species uh, requires the presence of some other species to be there before it can recover and establish. Um, in this situation, we can get lots of babies coming in to recover the place, but they don't necessarily settle and, and, um, and recover because of, of these kinds of uh, feedbacks. Hysteresis can occur when species that arrive in a recovering patch change the physical structure and therefore change the trajectory that that system is on. These recovery trajectories give us important information um, if we're trying to manage for ecosystem improvement because some actions assume that recovery can happen um, in a kind of linear and continuous way like that top uh, graph there. But lags uh, in recovery or slow or no recovery um, are quite common actually in, in the natural environment. So some environmental management interventions require passive recovery to occur for them to be considered successful if, if the goal was to manage um, for an improvement in state. Um, and these kinds of interventions can include things like limiting stresses in the catchment like sediments or nutrients um, running into the coastal environment, but also things like benthic protection from uh, bottom trawling or dredging and also marine protected areas. And if we're managing for recovery, then it's useful for us to know whether or not recovery is likely to occur when these types of interventions are made. Um, and the success is often dictated by how long society is willing to wait to see the change. Recovery largely depends on whether um, physical or biological legacies have been left by the stressor, how large the area is um, that's been damaged, 
what the key tra traits of the species are and whether biological feedbacks have been altered. Whilst recovery of ecological communities includes um, multiple species, and we're often trying to um, get that biodiversity back, there's often key species that have important functional roles in the recovery process. So, for example, crabs and shrimps, um, they break up you know, terrestrial sediment that's been deposited on the seabed and help to resuspend it early in the recovery process, whereas uh, mollusks come in later and they provide important settlement structure for new recruits to settle on. So um, we often can focus on these kinds of key species traits when we're thinking about what might be driving recovery. But apart from these things, um, these important functional roles during the recovery process, individual species may also be um, key in the recovery process because they can have cultural or commercial roles as well. So we often think about key attributes of species that are important for determining or predicting this recovery potential. And these include things like the life history traits of the species. How long do they take to mature and reproduce? Um, how mobile are they at different life stages? How often do they reproduce? Um, but they also include things like, do the species provide structure that helps other species to recover? So are they facilitators in that environment? Um, so I've just talked about some of these kind of key features of species, but it's not just about the species. It's all about, it's also about the nature of the landscape that we're trying to recover. Recovery depends on attributes in the surrounding seascape. Um, and important attributes of the seascape include things like how connected is an area to uh, species that can supply new babies to that, to that disturbed place. How big is the area relative to how far the different species can travel? Um, and in this diagram here, it's showing that if we have a very small area within an estuary that needs to be recovered, um, the babies or the adults can come from very close by. But the bigger the area we have to recover, the slower it is because babies have to travel from really far distances. And sometimes that might not be possible or there might not even be a supply of babies. Um, recovery also depends on the timing of disturbances relative to their reproductive timing, and if we have disturbances that are continuously happening, this also can limit recovery. So these are the kinds of attributes that allow recovery to occur, but what if these attributes mean that recovery is not possible? So when passive recovery isn't likely due to these kinds of factors that I've talked about, um, managers can turn to active interventions that assist in the recovery process. And this usually means actively restoring structure and these facilitation relationships that block natural recovery occurring. Um, or it can include things like removing a, a legacy of, of past disturbance. Around the world, key species have been um, transplanted either as adults or juveniles to provide the structure. For example, there are examples around the world of seagrass replantings, mangrove replantings, and um, the reseeding of shellfish. Um, there are also examples of restoration, uh, including the removal of environmental legacies, for example, removing contaminated sediment or um, covering it up. But the success of uh, when we do these kinds of interventions, uh, when we seed adults or juveniles, the success then depends on the ability of an area to self-recruit um, attract new recruits from surrounding areas, these facilitation relationships being restored and intact, um, and then once that happens, we're kind of into this uh, uh, area where the disturbance recovery dynamics that control success are similar to this passive recovery that I talked about before. So I've talked about interventions that depend on passive recovery, and I've talked about interventions that assist in the recovery process. So we've been developing new frameworks based on key attributes of places and species to assess um, recovery potential. From an ecological perspective, if a decision has been made to uh, manage for recovery um, of a particular species or habitat, then the disturbance recovery dynamics of that habitat can help guide whether recovery is likely to happen within a desired time frame or not. And this diagram is a framing for prioritising areas for different interventions associated with their likelihood for recovery. 
So firstly, um, the state of the landscape and its biodiversity must be assessed, um, and that's in the grey boxes at the top there. And if, if we have a situation where we've got very low biodiversity and high regional degradation, um, then passive recovery may not be possible simply because there's just not enough recruits in the area to supply um, to supply new babies to, to get the species back that we want. Um, and so we may need to actively assist recovery if the desired outcome is a landscape that has high biodiversity, high resilience and high delivery of function and services. But if the landscape's in good shape, then we can start to assess attributes at the local site that we're trying to recover. And these depend largely on these kind of, um, the presence of these facilitatory relationships and, and what the traits of those species have. And we can determine whether or not passive recovery will be slow, whether it will be quick, um, or whether it's actually just not likely to happen within um, acceptable timeframes to us, whatever that may be. Um, specifically, the nature of these kind of habitat forming species can help us um, because they're critical in the recovery process. And through a series of yes or no questions, we can actually very simply determine what type of recovery trajectory might be most likely. So at the top of this um, yes no flow diagram here, we've got a question about whether or not the environmental conditions will support the species that we're trying to recover. And if the answer is no, then that means that legacy effects of kind of past environmental conditions are likely to prevent recovery. But if the answer is yes, then we can ask a series of um, yes or no questions about whether or not any of the species present, um, whether or not there are any of the species remaining there that we want that we want to come back in, in good amounts, whether there's nearby locations that have the species that we want to recover, whether the adults can move um, very far. And these very simple yes or no questions can help us determine whether or not there's likely to be fast recovery, um, like in this purple bo box at the end point there, or whether or not slow recovery is going to occur because simply because of the time frames for the growth of the of the species, or whether or not no recovery will happen um, because of these things like bottlenecks and hysteresis that simply just block recovery from occurring. We can also use this in a screening process to prioritise areas that are most likely to recover passively. This way we can rule out areas that don't qualify suitable for passive recovery and potentially use this to prioritise areas for protection, but importantly also for restoration. And this prioritisation um, assigns scores to habitats or sites based on whether there's um, the potential to reduce stresses firstly, um, and that means things like uh, the stresses that are limiting recovery of the system already, so can we, can we reduce those? Um, if we can, are there existence of legacies, which means that even if those stresses are actually removed, um, the legacy of their effect can remain for a long time. So this is things like sediments and nutrients that um, can remain in the coastal system for many years even after we stop adding more. Um, and also then thirdly, what is the ability of new species to arrive and self-populate or self-recruit into that area and, and allow it to recover? Based on these three things, each site can then be scored um, a, a, on a relative scale, where zero would mean that the site doesn't qualify for passive recovery and closer to one would mean it would be the highest priority for, um, for recovery occurring. So in summary, um, disturbance recovery dynamics can give environmental managers a lot of useful information for understanding how different types of interventions are likely to result in improvements in the state of the ecosystem. And this information can be crucial um, for environmental risk assessment, which Fabrice is going to speak about next. Um, but importantly also for managing um, our expectations for recovery and, and what time frames um, might, we might be looking at for different outcomes in different places. And I guess the take home message uh, from me is that there's massive context dependency in, in ecosystem responses and weird things can happen and we should expect these things to happen. Um, and we're just trying to give uh, environmental managers some guidance about making decisions that doesn't rely on um, hugely data-hungry models uh, and perfect information of a place, um, but these decisions can potentially just be guided by our empirical research on disturbance recovery dynamics in uh, marine systems. <laughs>
Thanks.